Um, so I want to thank uh, Steve for, and, and uh, John for inviting me. Um, I bring a different perspective, and I hope that what I'm going to say is you'll find interesting. Um, I am the Medical Director for Trauma Services BC, which is a new organization, and, and I'm not sure it has parallels really in other provinces. It's, a, uh, it's, a, it's basically an evolution, I think, of our Provincial Trauma Advisory Committee into something that is uh, more um, inculcated in the governance and accountability structure of healthcare in the province. So it has roles with uh, the Provincial Health and Service Authority, it has uh, links to government, and it has linkages to, to the health authority. So to me, it's, it's really uh, a really important evolution of where trauma systems go. And I spent a lot of time thinking about um, you know, how to optimize the work that we can do in trauma. And, and I'm uh, not surprised, a little surprised, how much trauma has dominated your conversation today as, as pre-hospital folks. And, um, and I'm constantly thinking about you know, how to chip away at the preventable death and morbidity that happens in our system. And, and I'm acutely aware of the critical role that you as paramedics play. And so I want to thank John for inviting me. And I'm really encouraged that, uh, that you know, here in BC, we have a, a great familiarity with each other and our organizations are becoming uh, much more integrated, which is, which is great. Um, so I hope you find some of this interesting. We'll see if I can make this do what it's supposed to. The green one. The green one. I can't read that. <laughs> so it's going to be a problem. But, uh, so you know the the issue is simply that uh, um, I'd like to share with you in the next sort of twenty five minutes what our vision for the trauma system is in BC and how it uh, integrates with the, the pre hospital system and how sort of I think a whole system view of this uh, of of the trauma system, if you will, um, has everything to do with the uh, optimization and success. And that whole system notion is that is an important one. It really goes to you know, the culture and um, organizational culture and integration that, that in which we all work, whether we're in health authorities or uh, pre-hospital organization or, or disaster management or whatever it is, uh, we just within a culture of, of uh, that, that contains us all. And I think that's what the whole system notion is all about. Um, like uh, every province uh, that I'm aware of, I've lived in a couple and worked in, in, in colleagues across the nation, uh, our trauma system has evolved as a coalescence of you know well-intended effort by some, some really strong leadership. John has, has played some role in that. Um, these are the people who I think I would credit uh, among many, many others with building our trauma system in BC, which I think stands to become uh, very highly functional. Um, these are just basically, most of them are surgeons. Well, the third one, the last one is a nurse who been evolved into a a uh, leadership role, but uh, these are people who were struggling to take care of patients. The first, uh, as a general surgeon, the an orthopedic surgeon who just got, I think, tired of the disorganized management of the multitude of fractures that roll into the emergency department, and that's that's how a lot of trauma systems start. And so we credit the, you know, the, 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 where we got to uh, with the strong leadership of a few people, but if you don't have strong people and you don't have a vested interest, often you don't have a system, and I think that that's one of the challenges we we're trying to work with is how to sustain a good system. This is this is what we have in British Columbia to some degree. Sorry, um, we have about uh, 15 hospitals that are uh, sort of reasonably categorized as level one, two, and three centers. Most of them have registry uh, support, and so we have a data flow that goes with them, giving us some, some metrics on, on what's happening. Um, and then in addition to that, we have. Uh, uh, we have five regional trauma programs, we have five health regions in BC, and they all are variably organized programs that try to integrate the care that happens with the patients, with uh, the environment they worked in, so that's integrating with the pre-hospital system and, and all the things that happen after that. And then we have the EMS that's superimposed on that and integrated with it, going too fast here. Uh, and those are these, these are basically the list of assets that, that we have, and you've you know very well what we're, what the BC is, uh, is doing in terms of uh, pre-hospital care. So this is kind of what most people think of when they think of our trauma system. Um, but the question I always ask myself is, you know, do we have a, a good trauma system? It sounds like a rhetorical question, but I would ask all of you to consider that for, for your home provinces or where you come from. Do you have a good system? Um, it's not an easy question to answer. Uh, we always say it, it's pretty good, but it could be better. But then, then how do you actually uh, act on that, uh, that, that, that uh, notion? 
Um, if we talk about what happens to some of our, our patients, if you ask this guy who was shot about uh, a couple of blocks from here, uh, point blank in the chest by a disgruntled uh, associate uh, and arrived pulseless at, the, at our hospital up the road um, and, and underwent a, a pretty heroic uh, salvation with a good recovery, it's a, it's a phenomenal system. Everything worked in that guy's favor at that moment on that, on that day, from pre-hospital right to the very end. If you ask the, uh, the parents of this girl who was in a car crash uh, up in northern BC uh, and spent a lot of time waiting for services and, and transferring between hospitals, um, had a, ended up dying um, of basically what sounded like a spleen and pelvic injury, uh, not such a good system. So I think it's a really, it's an important question to ask. We know that the mortality of trauma patients in the periphery, which is 20% of our, of our clients, are about double uh, what happens in the urban centers. So having a, a thoughtful approach to our system, I think, is really important. Certainly, you know, we have a huge fire up in Burns Lake, which is a thousand kilometers from here in the middle of January, in the middle of the night, and within 12 hours, 25 patients were delivered to definitive care somewhere, which I think is a phenomenal accomplishment, and bus crashes and other things as well. So just to say that this is our system, and it's very hard to, uh, to, to put a very constructive, um, optic on, on how you define whether it's working well or could be working better. We have some really crude metrics. Uh, this is a study that was helped, helped um, with uh, nationally just to show what the mortality rate, which is the crude <coughs> metric that we tend to use to judge how good our system is, uh, varies about twofold among provinces and about threefold among the trauma centers. Uh, so, you know, you may have, a, you have an average mortality rate in hospitals of about 4%, some provinces have 8 this is uh, the best data that we could uh, assemble. And, and we don't really know if that's good or bad. Um, it's, there's so much more to know about our patients that, that simply that, but if that's what we're using as metrics, it becomes quite complicated to A, know how well we're doing, and B, what we can do better. We have one of these. A lot of people have some of these. These are Accreditation Canada certification for, uh, for distinction in trauma. Um, it's, a, it's an important accomplishment, and it represents, uh, I think, a very an important effort to judge the, the optimal performance of our systems. But it's very hard to connect that to the, the, the pieces that we know could be completely better uh, and improved to, to improve patient care. Uh, and even despite all of that, our low mortality rate and, the, and our Accreditation Canada document, we have this patient who, who comes mm -hmm. in every day to our emergency room has four fractures are all casted and nobody wants to take care of them. Uh, this is an actual patient that broke on our emergency room at our level one trauma center and, and took us 12 hours to find the um, MRP for this guy. Um, and he asked the public whether they have a good trauma system. Sometimes they're not so favorable. Nobody ever says how great things are. People always tell me how bad they are. Um, but I think, you know, the accountability to the public and to the government and to the payers is a really important part of a functioning trauma system and how you define that accountability is a big uh, focus of what we're trying to do in British Columbia right now. So it all comes down to what do you mean by a trauma system? And to me, it's a lot like this, this elephant diagram where depending on what part you're looking at, uh, the system can be many things. Um, and it's no different, I think, for a trauma system where we tend to think about it as trauma, trauma centers and, and EMS and some degree of data collection and um, you know, and, and levels of designation, but you know how you verify that and how often, whether it's voluntary. Or not. These are all really very major variables in what your system actually is, and who's accountable for making sure that it's working, um, and and what standards are set. It's fine to say you, you know you've, you've got a system of designation, but if nobody checks it and nobody holds you to account, okay, what, what, you know what's the value of that? Um, and so when we think about it, it's all these things uh, and the trauma. Uh, the uh, Trauma Association <coughs> defines trauma system, I think, really well as not just um, acute care management uh, across the spectrum, but injury prevention, disaster management, public advocacy, self-learning, quality, um, all of those things are part of it. And how you integrate all those parts is the hard part. So the notion of a whole system is not new. It's at the, inf the Institute for Healthcare Improvement in the United States has, I think, has a very useful paradigm for looking at uh, health systems as, you know, being part of uh, the entire um, population-based effort. So that involves government and involves our culture of, 
integrating organizations and you know, it's not just simply do you have a plan you know for trauma system designation and do you have algorithms for pre hospital care it's about the environment that those things operate together and then that's what the whole system approach is about uh, and so if you look at a system I mean this is sort of my my take on what, what trauma systems generally are um, I as a surgeon focus on acute care and hospital survival you as paramedics and, and pre-hospital folks focus on doing the best you can in the field as quickly as possible, getting patients to where they're supposed to go. The rehab people function, focus on their function, the functional outcomes. Uh, the networks, uh, call transfer networks, focus on it. call efficiency. Um, injury prevention folks focus on reducing rates of injury. Uh, so it goes on like that, and, and we're all kind of focusing on different parts. And I think the thing, and this is all in the background of different accountability structures and governance, whether it's government or health authorities or municipalities or universities. Uh, in Quebec, the insurance bureau, the auto insurance bureau has a lot to do with uh, how, the, how the trauma system operates. So these are the things that are actually driving our operations underneath. And if you put it all together, to me, it's all about, you know, what do each of those things do, organizations do to reduce the burden of injury, um, the total burden of injury, whether that's societal or for the patients. And so the more we can orient towards that, the more I think we can find our common ground and, and align our Functions. But I think that trauma systems right now are in, a, in, a, in, a, in another stage of evolution where we're going from not simply well organized pre hospital and hospital care to regionalized care to provincial systems, but, but really um, the systems of accountability, governance, and operating on a, on a much higher level in terms of uh, trying to achieve the outcomes that we, that we want. And so, what I wanted to share with you some of the initiatives that I think TSBC has undertaken. I'll tell you again that up until about 2012, TSBC didn't exist. We were a provincial trauma advisory council. We didn't really advise anybody um, except ourselves, which we've gone a long way with, in fact. We've been on that council for over 15 years, I think. Um, and it's similar to other provinces as well. There was some ministerial attachment, but that person would variably show up, didn't really have a, a mandate for being there. Um, EMS participated in that for sure, but mostly it was trauma medical directors, uh, trauma coordinators in the hospital, um, some very motivated pre-hospital folks, and we sat around and talked about how we can make things better. And a lot got done, for sure, but when the rubber hits the road and you have problems to solve, you need to have some governance accountability with uh, the health authorities or the ministry. Uh, if you need a big shake up, you need to turn things around, you need to have the authority to do that. And that group um, produced three different commission reports over over generating provincial trauma system in big capital letters uh, over the span of about uh, i would say it's, it's 1996 to now so probably 15 years three commission reports came out and they all said the same thing to create an oversight office integrate the organizations better um, and, uh, and you know and function like a business um, and all three of those took such a, you know, the first two didn't do anything, and the third one finally set up this office, small office of a few people who basically had control of the registry, which was the main thing, but they also had a few dollars to spend on health authorities. And then the authority to make formal connections to pre-hospital system or, um, or public health or the coroner's office or uh, the insurance agency. So that's been very, very helpful, but it's still a small group. So this is kind of what we've been working on. The first thing is having established agreements with all the health authorities in the regional trauma programs as to what they're supposed to be doing. I know that Ontario is kind of going through a reorganization of its, of its trauma systems and, and developing regional trauma programs to cover the whole province. I think that's really critical, and if each one kind of does its own thing, it's very hard to function as one, one organization. And so now uh, we have a financial agreement with a little bit of money that, we, that has existed to pay for trauma directors and programs. Um, but there are deliverables and accountabilities now that didn't teach us before. So that's the first step. Um, and the next thing is, is really developing formal, formalized relationships with, with key partners. Um, John's been fantastic about being open-minded about having a formal arrangement with pre-hospital system and, and the trauma the trauma office and, you know, as part of the system. Uh, we're, He's uh, been working, I think, quite diligently on finding purchase points where we can help each other do, uh, do the same job uh, together uh, better. Uh, I have lots to say about that. And, you know, and I think the, the talk on the field triage criteria coming up is an example of a bit of that collaboration. Um, same in the injury prevention world. There's a whole other area of public health that it does affect what we do in trauma. 
and having an official position with the right committees and the government to inform that and use our data has been really helpful. Awesome. <coughs> These are some of the pre-hospital system inter, um, um, efforts that we've, I guess, collectively talked about maybe doing. John might not remember all of this, but we put this on paper once. And uh, the field triage guidelines, I think, for the entire province was one of them. And it's, uh, you know, proudly we can say that's accomplished. And you're going to hear from uh, Wilson and Juan about that. Who, had uh, a lot to do with it, but it sounds so basic, but to actually have the same set of rules apply across the province has not been easy to accomplish. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things we could talk about in terms of, um, uh, I guess, disaster management, uh, our, our quality programs, our research programs, um, and, and other ways that we can look at, so just partnering to get the most out of each other's work. Um, so this is the guideline, I won't take, well, uh, Thunder is going to talk about it, but uh, I think it's a, uh, it really just shows, you know, that we can do this together, and and, and we can help disseminate what's in that guideline to the, to the physicians in a way that I think is much more useful. We can also inform the process a bit, and and we can both together measure whether it's working and doing what it's supposed to do, which I think is what's critical. Um, behind that, uh, we um, I guess have really focused on the whole episode of care. It's, it, the registry has allowed us to look only really at individual hospitals and outcomes, but we're interested in that whole trajectory from, you know, from being injured at a rural hospital to going up to a level three hospital to be transferred to a specialized center. That whole episode of care is what we're interested in, not just what happens to each of those, those ventures. And I really have to credit, uh, you know, Phil Yoon, I think he's gonna talk also about there, I don't know, but uh, um, with uh, the EPOS program here has introduced a level of oversight and, and really knowledge about our system to, to um, to physicians who are now helping to, to sort of captain these, these, uh, these tra the trajectory of these patients. Uh, the decision making to, to move a patient from one place to another is really difficult. It's, it's hard to algorithmize and it takes real knowledge of, of expert people to, to make good decisions. And, and to me, you know, it's, it's not just simply about getting a patient from A to B, it's about did you do it you know, the, and the right priority with the right resources at the right, uh, you know, to the right folks. And I think that an understanding that we've done the best we can in the decisions about moving patients is, uh, is really a critical part of our function. Um, and then, uh, you know, as in terms of evaluating performance improvement and patient safety, having a structure to do that is, uh, is not, is not, uh, is, is critical, but it's not easy to develop. I can say that, um, we we're not even able to have interagency conversations about quality issues for patients without putting one agency or another at risk. We didn't have um, you know confidentiality and uh, protection from from discovery to be able to do that. We could do it in our hospital. I think Hamilton could do it in their setting, but we couldn't get together on the phone and talk about it without somebody being at risk. And so one of the big achievements is now we have a protected mechanism in which to have interagency conversations about real patients with their data to talk about what went well, what what didn't go well. And so that to me is a huge, huge accomplishment. It's taken a long time to get the legal background for that, uh, the legal infrastructure in place. And we haven't used it very much yet, but we're about to. But I think as much as data, data points <laughs> measuring the indicators gives you some picture of whether you're doing your job or not, talking about real patients and what actually happened to them is another fantastic way to figure out whether or not your patients are, are getting well treated. So we're counting on this system a lot to, to help improve things. Um, and I think that the things that I would say are, are the metrics that you wanna judge your system. If you ask, do you have a trauma system? I think you can't, can't answer that question unless you can talk about, um, number one, the appropriateness of triage. And I would say appropriateness, not necessarily it's under or over triage, but was it appropriate? Uh, you know, um, and that's a hard question to answer. And the second thing is, how much preventable death and morbidity uh, do you have? And how much of it is reducible? So I think until you can talk about those two things, you really can't make a comment about how good your trauma system is. Um, to support that effort though, um, we did have the registry. It's, a, it's the biggest asset that, that trauma services BC has. It's about a million and a half dollars. So we pump into um, 17 data registry people and their software. We lock these poor people into windowless rooms, making them review charts uh, for hours, uh, hours on end. And then, you know, I think we have an obligation to use that data, or at least their time, to, to really um, improve our system. And, 
And I have to say, I think that we've fallen down on that a lot, that we could do a lot better job using those people to get information on how to improve our system. And so uh, one of the things that we've done, and, th and this is the kind of stuff that would come out of that, we would get pie charts and you know histograms, uh, basically after all of that uh, effort. Um, this is from uh, Alberta, but this is very similar to all the trauma, uh, annual trauma reports that come out across the country. Very, very simplistic, don't direct action. They're really, they're very descriptive. Um, and I think we owe it to our patients and we owe it to the, you know, the resources we're investing to be much more insightful about what's going on in our system than simply pumping out pie charts and uh, at the end of the, all that effort. And that's not that we do the same, we, we're doing the same thing up until very recently. Um, and so the biggest thing that I think we've done in terms of data is just making linkages between existing data sets. So we now link to a whole hospital discharge abstract data set so we can find trauma patients in every hospital in BC. And it wasn't until we did that that we realized that, that uh, only two-fifths of the patient with injuries die in our trauma hospitals. Another two-fifths um, die in other hospitals that are not, don't have a registry in our trauma hospitals. I assume they're broken hips, but they might not be. Um, and that's still that they're still injury. And another whole fifth don't even make it to a hospital. So we found that by, by linking to coroner's data and vital statistics. So really when we publish those reports, we're only talking about two fifths of the patients that, that die with injury. And we think that in a whole system view, you have to know what's going on. Should we be able to retrieve that one fifth that doesn't make it to a hospital? But should we be transferring some of those two fifths that, that, that die in non trauma hospitals? Until we know that, uh, then more about that, we really can't talk about our system. Happy to say that we've done a lot of rejigging. We've re-evaluated the value of every variable that we collect. We've thrown a lot of them out. We've found other sources for different ones, and we've created sort of more capacity to, to analyze, uh, at least to collect and analyze data, and put a lot of effort into creating dashboards that are queryable. They don't just reports. You can go online and, and ask questions about you know, this, this set of patients or another using this, this, this cube technology where you can interact, you can uh, query data sets uh, quite easily. So just to say that we've redefined some metrics and have set some high targets for what the standards would be. Um, again, an interactive web tool just to show you that there's tons of stuff that you can do with this once you set it up. Uh, we've, and we've linked several databases together at the, at the um, NACRS data set is, is being pulled into this as well. We want EMS data into it. Uh, the coroner's data set is, is being linked to this. So we'll be able to query real questions about not just what's in the registry. Um, we got a lot of money not that long ago to set up a network of trauma advisory specialists. So it's an interesting concept. Um, and it took a lot of, it was I think well, well received by the mission that was offering money for physician sort of championed uh, initiatives to improve patient care. And what we came up with was the idea of a, of a regionally representative network of specialist advisors and for trauma. So imagine a, a group of orthopedic surgeons representing all each of the health regions that come together and talk about, you know, what's the, uh, what's the optimal management for, you know, a, a severe acetabular fracture or an open tip fib? Um, what is the, uh, where is the optimal place for that patient to be managed? What would be a guideline for managing that? And so these groups we've developed now in, in the spine surgery burns, uh, in diagnostic imaging, we have a regional, we have a provincial uh, guideline for trauma imaging now that is supposed to be about to roll out across the province. Uh, for pediatrics, uh, for neurocritical care, for complex plastics, complex general surgery, and complex orthopedics. And so the good thing about that is that, that each health region uh, has representation in, you know, it's, it's it's not as strong as it could be because initially we're just starting this off in some of the groups, but they've come together over the last year or so to develop provincial practice guidelines on the management of, of complex injuries. Um, and it's really important because, you know, for instance, if here's, I think, if you look at the uh, the guidelines that people have in there, or the, the, the regional trauma programs have in there, in there um, on their books that they're 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 basically ripped out of other other textbooks and, and don't really mean that much. Uh, uh, this guideline on pelvic fractures doesn't really tell you what to do. It tells you what your options are. It's hard to implement in a, in a regionalized system where there's a rural component to that and, a, and an urban component. Um, so we developed a, a process by to develop really practical <coughs> guidelines that could be used by a rural physician 
all the way up to uh, a tertiary care provider. <coughs> Basically asking what, the, what are the key injuries that you're worried about managing, whether it's a blunt aortic injury or a bad head injury or flail chest, like the really serious stuff. Uh, what would be the key management questions about you know, what the, an eMERGE doc would be facing or a paramedic? Uh, what do we know about the answers to those questions? Uh, what would the recommendations of this group, not just based only on evidence, but also their consensus as, as provincial experts be on what to do? Um, uh, let's create an algorithm that, set, that shows that and then develop the performance measures to show that we're actually following the algorithm. So one of the things that we're hoping to do is be able to show uh, compliance with provincial algorithms and at least guidelines, which I think is really important. Um, so for, for bad pelvic fractures that are you know, hemodynamically unstable, how many of them were managed according to the provincial guideline versus work? So I think that those are important metrics for, for the system. And, and it's, it really does matter because what, what, what can happen is, you know, if a patient shows up with a bad pelvic fracture and, and uh, they decide they need to go to angio and, uh, versus, and there's no angio in your hospital, that, that sends you down a pathway. Um, this group considered that particular question and have decided that the best thing to do with them in some really dire cases is to pack them and pelvis. And that means that, that we have to keep those patients, a selection of those patients in a hospital and have general surgeons or orthopedic surgeons intervene, but the reviewing literature and developing consensus. So that's a big decision. I don't know if it's a good decision, but it's a consensus based decision of the orthopedic surgeons in the province that this is the, and general surgeons that this is probably the best thing to do rather than transfer a man with the unstable pelvic fracture across the province to, uh, to a higher, higher level of care. So that's where it's been valuable. And then we shared accountability for that outcome by the, by the entire group. Um, and these can be valuable for, for many reasons, but I think for adjudicating quality and, and for teaching, um, I think it's really helpful to have a provincial approach to, to all of these problems and how you solve them. One of the, the, the major things we're just about to embark on is, is developing a tiers of service framework for, for the trauma system. It's kind of assumed, and I think the public assumes it, and most physicians assume that there is, you know, we talked about level one to five hospitals. It's, you guys hope we all recognize that terminology. I'm talking about that, that for 30 years, um, based on the American College paradigm uh, that the Trauma System Canada has adopted and, and, and refined. But the reality is not, that that system is not formally endorsed anywhere in our province. Um, there's no commitment necessarily of any health authorities to adopt or stick to or, or, or adhere to those guidelines. And what's missing, I think, is the same thing we just talked about with the specialists is, you know, what does the application of that look like in our province where every hospital is part of the system? And how do you build accountability into it? Um, and so we're hoping to be able to to have a provincially endorsed system of designation that actually means something and is not voluntary, um, and that is uh, it's going to be verified on a regular basis, not simply by voluntary accreditation Canada visit, but something that we do regularly in the province to make sure that that the performance expectations are defined in every hospital and that and that the resources uh, are there to support them if if uh, uh, if they're not. Um, so just to show you, this is a standard. Tactic. And I tons of credit to Dr. Catalan for leading this effort to create this for a Kent Canadian adaptation, I think, of the American College uh, uh, structure. But I, the next step to me is that we need to have these provincially endorsed uh, by the health authorities in the province to say, yes, we, we're going to make that happen in, in all of the hospitals in the province. Um, and this has already happened uh, to some degree in stroke and child health in BC, and the government's very interested right now to have tiers of service frameworks defined for all the specialized services. Um, so we're, I think, at a good moment in time to be doing that. One challenge is that tier six is level one, and so that's creating, creating confusion and nomenclature, which is really flipping out some people. But the bottom line is that there's different levels and they do different things, and we just want to be very specific about what that means. Um, and at the end of the day, I think what we want to end up with, which I haven't been able to find in, in other provinces, is a real trauma system plan that describes operations, not just uh, aspirations. And I think that that's, that's a quite a different, a different thing. Um, this is sort of how I look at our trauma system. On one side, we have, uh, well, right down the middle, we have the health authorities, uh, which really control the care of patients. On one side, we have provincial health services, which oversees a lot of the specialized programs, whether it's cancer or, uh, or stroke or cardiac services, but also trauma now. 
uh, NBC, uh, which is our health emergency management folks for disaster, uh, BCHS, which, which now brings together paramedics and the call system, uh, falls within that. Um, and so we have a really great uh, co-location of key services that have provincial scope. We have one annual system, not 300 like some provinces. I think that makes it really easy. We have one data sharing system that we can link together. Um, and I think we have, you know, we have, we have a system that's, that's set up to be optimized. And I think that that's what our challenge is right now to do. Um, and then how you connect that to injury prevention and surveillance and, and uh, work, you know, and work as compensation <coughs> things and insurance board bureau for uh, automobile uh, insurance. I think these are other opportunities for us to connect through through ministry and whatnot. Um, we got our first mandate from the government finally, where it acknowledges that there should be a trauma system. It's the first time I think that's been written in on uh, you know government letterhead, um, and PHSA has been given the mandate to assure the appropriate um, access to high performing, comprehensive, integrated, and inclusive trauma system provided. Uh, oversight provided by trauma services BC to have so have that come from the Minister of Health is a big deal um, and so now there is accountability and governance supposed to be to go along with that and uh, there are many things to continue working on I think the biggest thing is going to be verifying that our system functions and I think that's not simply about the hospitals but the integration with the EMS as well so it's going to be uh, a really key part of that I'm excited to work with John and everybody else to, to make that happen so success you know the business model is all about being flexible and uh, you know uh, having innovative ideas and bringing your team together and really planning for the outcomes you want uh, in the trauma world it's going to be about connecting all the different parts that go into that it's not simply about me sitting down with trauma directors or john sitting down with his uh, you know his team uh, it's about all of us sitting down and talking about trauma patients uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in a very productive way so trauma systems exist to deal with this, right? and you've talked a lot about trauma today, um, but that critically salvageable bleeding patient is, is a very you know, good way to look at whether your trauma system is, is working or not. Uh, this is a real picture of a case we got involved in last year, somebody who was stabbed in the chest not very far from here. Uh, the EMS care was, was phenomenal, and you know, all the parts of the system came together to work for that. Um, wasn't perfect, uh, as it turns out. Um, and our care, I think, ended up being phenomenal. This is a guy who, uh, but we also made mistakes. Um, and, it's, uh, and I think the thing about bleeding critically injured patients is there's a little bit of there's a little bit of margin sometimes, but there's not a, a lot. And and the whole system exists uh, to salvage these patients. This this is the only patients I've ever declared dead, um, and then decided changed my mind and went back to work on. Uh, and it wasn't just me, it was a whole team of emergency physicians, the paramedics who brought the patient, uh, did a phenomenal job in setting up, setting the mindset of everybody um, and making that connection uh, so that after 90 minutes of manual cardiac massage and units and units of blood uh, in a very difficult case, this, uh, this guy gets to walk away from the hospital. Um, I think that's, that's a good salvage. But for all the, those patients, there are the ones that we know we could have done better with. Um, I think this is a real good example of why we work together, why I'm glad to be here to talk to you about uh, the bigger picture of trauma and uh, why I think, you know, really integrating organizations uh, into a service plan that is alive and dynamic is, uh, is, is what we need to get to and uh, really thrilled to have been part of uh, this effort because it's a good demonstration, I think, of how we're starting to connect across organizations to, uh, to make things work well. Uh, I think that's it, yeah. So thank you, I, I don't know if that was interesting to you. It's, uh, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very noble effort and I'm, I'm really impressed with the level of discussion and the depth of insight and uh, the quality of the conversation uh, today and yesterday. Just really, really thrilling to be here, thanks.